Well, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. It's been, it's been a fast. It's been a really fast year. It has. It's, it has. Been, a, it's been a brutally fast year. We, we Lewis is uh, Lewis is guarding me with great care because uh, we'll talk very shortly about one of the amendments to the closing the loopholes bill. He, I think he just said last night, he rang me and he said, I've never seen you so angry and fired up in your life. So when we get to that, we'll have a moment of entertainment, I suspect, from me. Um, we have quite a bit to cover today um, uh, and, and a, few, a few novel topics at the back end. Yes. One, of, one of your, we'll call it one of your pet favourites at the moment, which we'll get to, but um, want to need to talk about tranche three and the IR reforms. Just want to cover off that. Very importantly, uh, yesterday evening, the uh, government and a variety of other parties moved various amendments to the bill. Um, as we speak, I think those amendments are going through the lower house. They are, that's right. Lewis has his phone sitting on the desk, not, not for any particular reason other than this. We're trying to find out whether or not as we go live, one of the amendments that we're particularly concerned about actually gets up in the lower house. We're going to talk about some of that today as well. A um, little bit about the growing role of the Fair Work Commission, although a bit moderated by one of the things we're going to talk about. And then we're going to get on to one of Lewis's growing favourite topics. I'm not going to say drugs. Um, uh, we think medicinal marijuana usage is going to be one of those big issues for the next couple of years. Couple yeah. of years. Uh, Lewis just did some really outstanding work for a client on, on it. And I, th I think it's kind of like the first really good work I've seen about where it fits into drugs policy, all of that. We're going to tease you with that because I think it's something that everybody needs to start thinking about. It would be remiss given that Christmas is coming if we don't talk about the High Court and the public holidays issue before we finish and then, then we'll take some questions. So um, pr pretty broad and interesting agenda. But let's, let's, start, uh, let's start with the, uh, the exciting stuff with Tranche 3. Um, and the summary of the where we are now, you, we keep hearing different things. If you read the paper, the paper keeps saying things like the bill is going to get split. Some of it's going through before Christmas, but it's not going through before Christmas. No, so the, the, the bill to reform the Fair Work Act, Tranche 3, is being debated in the lower house now. Um, it may well pass the lower house today, tomorrow, but um, there is a Senate inquiry process into the bill that is not reporting back before the 1st of February. So we're not expecting the bill to be passing both houses of parliament until say March, at the, well, Feb, March. Um, Feb at the earliest, more likely perhaps late Feb, early March. Um, so that's the process we have. But the reason as Nigel alluded to, that there's a bit of activity at the moment is that there are amendments being debated right now about the bill in the lower house. And um, so that will affect some of the content that we're talking about today. There are actually some good developments. Some good bits. In fact, there's one employees. really big good bit, which will come to. So there are some good developments. There's some concerning developments. So we'll take you through them through the course of, of the webcast. Yeah. And uh, we, we will apologize at one point because uh, one of our slides just became completely irrelevant because of one of the amendments, uh, which, which as we understand, will we'll pass without any, uh, any antagonism whatsoever. Um, so the Senate, the bottom line is, Still got to wait for the Senate to come back in Feb. Yes. And so for those people who keep saying to us, something's going through before Christmas, the answer is that nothing's starting before Christmas, but the lower house might move this through before Christmas and then it all focuses on the Senate. Yes. It was always going to focus on the Senate anyway. Well, that's where that's where there's more uh, capability for negotiation because the government doesn't hold a majority in the Senate. So that'll so. be about the Greens, that'll be about Senator Pocock, Senator Lambie and the independents. So, so it'll become quite a political new year moving into February, I imagine, in relation to some of this. Yep. So that's that's where we are with timetable. Um, we, we've probably picked two or three topics that most people are talking to us about still. I can't help this, but we have to start with the gig economy. You, you know I hate that phrase, but that, that's for another day and probably a glass of red wine. Um, it, it's very clear that the legislation, uh, this part of the legislation is, I sense this part will pass. This seems to be relatively uncontroversial in terms of possibly getting the numbers for this part. Um, the uh, legislation is intended to regulate what we've described there as employee-like workers. We'll come back to that. Performing service contracts, we'll come back to that. And this delightful phrase, digital labour platform operators. Now, I'm going to ask you to have a go at it, and then I'm going to have a go at it, because we perhaps describe this slightly differently. Sure. 
Um, oh, you want to do that now? <laughs> well, well what, what's the digital labour platform? So a digital labour platform um, that's going to be subject to these laws is, is primarily a platform that's using a website or other data-based applications. So you're talking about your apps on your phones, you're talking about web-based um, software systems to, con- to engage, for a consumer to engage an independent contractor and... In, so it's got to be online. So online or through an app, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's to engage an independent contractor um, or otherwise utilise their services or otherwise aggregate payments that are coming in to be distributed to the independent contractor. So it's all about them being engaged directly by the consumer. It's about the consumer otherwise, even if it's not a formal engagement, using their services or it's about um, the website aggregating the payments that the independent contractor is collecting and then having them spat out to the independent contractor. If a website or an app is doing any of those activities, then it can, it can be considered a digital labour platform operator, which can be subject to these laws if it involves employee-like workers and if they're performing a service contract. Now, now you, you're of a different generation to me, so I imagine you're a menu log person <laughs> I've, you've got a young family i imagine you are but when i look at the employee like workers it, it smacks of the menu log yes men, on, on the scooter menu log, and uber uber, uber eats the, all, all of those types of things and i've been describing this notion of the digital platform i've been sort of describing it as the person running the platform effectively is the the agent or the broker between the consumer and the provider of the service yes is, is that that's broadly I how think, i think that's that's broadly correct yes yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's how we tend to see it. Now, in terms of power, because um, there's a bit about this which I think is interesting and then there's a bit that might be more worrying, but um, let me just start with uh, the, the overarching scope of this. It's interesting that the Commission is going to be given some different powers. It, it can actually create what, what are called minimum standard guidelines, which as I understand the guidelines, they're not necessarily going to be enforceable guidelines, but they're basically recommended that people follow them. And separate to that, it can actually make orders which are mandatory, you you must comply with. There's an interesting theme here which comes into the transport stuff we'll talk about a little bit later, but this notion of guidelines is interesting because it might well be that the Commission used this as a way of warming people up to regulation before actually regulating. Mm. Um, And that might be a a, a sort of a, a less... Uh, aggressive way of actually sort of bringing this into the marketplace. Uh, do, I don't know if you hold the same sense as me. Maybe not. You might not be as optimistic as me, but at least the opportunity is there to do that. But then it's about what could these orders cover, and that's quite dramatically different, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's certainly um, a, a limit to what the Commission can include in, can include in minimum standard or, orders, and you'll see that on your slide Uh, In particular, a lot of the monetary arrangements around overtime rates, um, rostering arrangements, things that are quite core to the engagement of a big worker have been left out. Um, What's left is things about insurance, about payment timeframes, deductions. Um, I suppose what you might consider as things that are ancillary to the relationship or also necessary to cover, but don't go to some of the core elements of, of this, including, for instance, penalty rates and things like that so so, so I, could, um, I could set a, a minimum hourly rate yes that's right but that would be different to setting a shift rate or an overtime rate that's a that's distinction. right yeah. and and in fact as part of the amendments there are there are indeed amendments also carving out penalty rates unless certain specific circumstances are met <clears throat> so you've really got a baseline that gets touched and then other things are carved out I do think that we'll see the commission move straight to orders, I think, on commencement because... Some some, some bits of the sector are so obviously in that's, the pub- that, that, That's what I think, that there's yeah, going to the be... The politics require it. That's right. There's going to be probably, certainly in food delivery, yeah. um, courier-type work by independent contractors doing this work. I think we'll see fast movement there perhaps then guidelines elsewhere. And and um, there may be something, we'll talk about road transport later, but so we'll see some level of standards orders come out. Uh, as part of the amendments, they've also provided that before the commission does do anything though, it has to issue a notice of intent uh, and give everyone a reasonable opportunity to be consulted 
before implementing. So there will be an orderly process, but this will be coming. And um, th this bit really interests me. So first of all, the commission can ratify collective agreements. So you could be menu log, by, we shouldn't pick on menu log, but yep. by way of example, menu log, they could come along and say, look, we've got a collective agreement with our, our delivery people. We want to actually have that registered and it then would have a legally applicable status. Yes. And it, as long as it's better off overall than the minimum standards, standards order itself, yeah. which is another reason why we might see minimum standards order early to set the baseline for collective. And it bargaining. might even be the very first minimum standards order, for instance, just says it's got one or two things in it just to get the ball rolling. Yeah, that, that's true. And then this is the bit that always intrigues me is this notion of being able to challenge, I love this phrase, an unfair deactivation. What's a deactivation? Well, it's basically <laughs> when someone is limited from using the platform uh, as a provider of a service. So if they are a deliverer, redriver, if they're either suspended from access. So from, I get a one star, and I don't use these platforms, you do. If I get a one star rating, I, I might be, the platform might be turned off for me for a week. Yeah, so I think the deactivation needs to be longer than seven days. So there is some period of, but if there's suspension for more than seven days or, or indefinitely, then they can bring a claim much like an unfair dismissal claim to have themselves reactivated onto the platform. Now, I haven't looked at this and you might not know the answer to this, Lou, but does, does that involve where you might have software which diminishes what it offers you? So, Because some of them have got algorithms for that. The, the, there's no doubt going to be... Um, there will no doubt be a gray area between when someone is deactivated, that means their access sense. is cut off, yeah. and whether for one reason or another they are getting less work, that might not be caught by the deactivation because it does contemplate a restriction on the ability to access. Uh, and so where workflows are mediated in some way or filtered, that might not be sufficient to capture this, and that's really going to be to the, to the providers as to how clever they get with some of the algorithms. And the deactivation code? There'll be a deactivation code that sets out some arrangements where it is lawful or, or I should say valid to deactivate. That hasn't been set yet, but it'll operate a little bit like the small business fair dismissal code. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how are people going to react? Oh, I've, got, I, I've got a few, but we'll, we'll, I'll let you start. Oh, I, I think this is largely being done by consent, to be honest. There's a couple of very big players in the industry that have reached a, con a broad... Um, I suppose, consensus position with the Transport Workers Union, with the government, that regulation was required here. They're not necessarily standing in the way. Um, and so I think what we'll see is quite an orderly process. That doesn't mean there won't be claims that they resist in the Fair Work Commission. I think it will be, I, I'm not necessarily thinking there'll be a lot of collective agreement making. I think it'll be minimum standards ordered, dominated to begin with. There will be an order that sets a base level. Um, it will then be for operators to see how well they can cooperate with that order. If it's fine for them, they probably won't collectively bargain. If they think there's some benefit to doing something different, they may. And deactivation remedies, I'm sure they will come up just like you get unfair dismissal. So we will see some claims for unfair deactivations and that, they'll be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think um, I think they're preparing for it to come in. And Yeah, I agree. And I, look, I... My view about this, and we've talked to one or two clients about this over the last little while, I, when you think about it, what, what model can you run? I mean, at the moment, your choice really is, do you, do you use uh, contracts or do you, do you use your own employees? And we've discussed how using your own employees is, is quite challenging because you've got all of the modern award labyrinths to go through. I suspect the majority of people out there are going to go, we're going to continue with our contract to model, we're going to accept it's going to be regulated, we're going to accept that that might mean minimum standards, we're going to accept it might mean we have to manage them slightly differently. But I think for the most part, the nature of the business model will probably stay the same. It will now be refined in the context of this. And, and the thing is, as long as the commission will have an appreciation, and it will, that you have contractors simultaneously working for multiple, multiple platform principles, yeah. as long as that's taken into account in the setting of the standards, then they will get a more model specific and and aligned minimum standard than if it was just an employee because if it's just an employee you need minimum engagement terms. Yeah, you need yeah. you need a base rate that covers a fair and livable wage for a day or whatever it is whereas the the whole unique thing about these platforms is people working on multiple ones at once so i think there 
as long as that's taken into account, and I suspect it will be, then there will probably be an avenue for an orderly kind of standards making process. And, and as you say, most of the big players will learn to work within that quite yeah. comfortably. I think that's true. I think that's true. Well, that's a big change in itself, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's yep. a big change. Um, same job, same pay. I, I might start and you might jump in. Um, and what I might do is, look, I might frame this and I might then hand over to you a little bit and then we might talk about what's changed last night or this morning because it's really, really important. Um, same job, same pay. Uh, be, be a little careful about what you might have seen in the media. Would that be, it's not an unreasonable thing to say. Um I think the beginning of this was a very simple industrial notion which unions have probably prosecuted for years, which is if, you're, if you have a site, we'll call that a cement manufacturing site, and you bring labour hire employees in, they should at least get the same rate as the people they're working alongside of. We'll be honest, at a lot of industrialised sites, that was probably the practice anyway. Um, so the first proposition here was when you bring labour hire in, unions were keen to make sure they got the same rate of pay as the people they work alongside of. The next question then became one of, well, a lot of companies have created their own labour hire firms, so these internal labour hire firms. Uh, you, they shouldn't be used to diminish or erode enterprise agreements that the employers negotiated. So again, the idea was, well, if you're going to use your internal labour hire company, you've got an enterprise agreement, they should get the same rate of pay in the enterprise agreement that they work alongside of. And uh, to be honest, in the last five years, there's been a pretty heavy proliferation of what we call in-house labour hire companies being set up. And then it all kind of got a bit crazy because uh, originally you and I thought it wasn't going to cover contracted services, but the way it was worded, it came out that it was. We also then were anxious when we first started talking about this that it's not just going to be labour hire and contracted services. We got worried about, you know, is this going to be, you know, as of a date, you can't do X. And then it changed. So we might, I might let you just walk us through where it changed, and then yep. I might let you walk us through, cool, then we'll come to the big change which is going through today. Yeah, so I think the starting point to appreciate is that this entire regime operates on application only. So, Which, which, which originally we, wasn't, we weren't necessarily thinking that. Which, but. which there, there were concerns that originally this might apply to all per companies engaging labour hire providers. In Class A, as of this date, that that's not the case. So, so to begin with, if you're a company using labour hire or an outsourced service provider of some kind, this regime only applies if a union brings an application for the labour hire provider you are using to be covered by your enterprise agreement. So you will have advance notice, effectively, that you are going to be subject to an application. Do you want me to jump to the tests or? Yes, yeah, so, so, so the next thing was, um, when would this apply and, and the acts or the, the reforms now propose a, a series of factors to be considered as to on, whether or on not, application. as to whether or not the application should succeed and a labour hire provider should be caught um, and, it, and have their terms and conditions equate to the host employers. Now, the big thing about and this- And the host employers enterprise agreement. The host employers enterprise agreement. Yeah. And, and it is all linked to enterprise agreements only. So- this is all about matching the labour hire provider's um, terms and conditions to that of the host employer's EA. Now, a few interesting things here. One, um, the factors to be considered, uh, a number of which are up there, um, are, are such that the commission is only restrain from making the order if these factors make it not fair and reasonable to make the order. So there's a, there's almost an onus on the on the person resisting the order to show it would not be fair and reasonable. W wouldn't quite um, as go as fast. That's a reverse onus, but it, 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 well, it, smell, yeah, it, it smells like a it, it does because once the commission's satisfied there's an EA at the at the host employer, once it's satisfied that there's a labour hire provider, the commission must make there's the, a presumption order, that the order. Will be made. It must make yeah. it unless the employer can demonstrate it would not be fair and reasonable to do so. So there is there is really an onus there on the employer to resist the application and demonstrate it is not fair and reasonable. Um, taking into account those types of factors, the biggest change here relates to outsourced service providers. So, um, and we should put a cross completely through this slide now. So where there is a service contract, 
And this slide is relevant to the extent that this helps you understand what is a service contract. Yeah. But where there is a service contract, um, if you establish you are providing a service as opposed to a labor, just solely the supply of labor, then that activity cannot be subject to this regime. And, and that will involve issues like the supervision of the work, as we've identified up here. Are you, are you managing a holistic service, provision of capital equipment and all of that? All those typical things you'd find in a contracted service, as opposed to we're just sending you some warm bodies. That's right. And there's obviously going to be some grey in between. And the explanatory memorandum actually to the amendments make this clear that you might have someone who both provides a service and supplies labor, and you might see it divided. Then I might say, oh, hang on, the supply of labor appears to be a severable um, activity that that will be caught, but the where you're providing a service might not be. And so the question is, well, what is this service? What is the, the service provider using their own plant and equipment for their own premises, their own uniform, their own uh, kind of tools, equipment, et cetera? That being might be- supervised by the host. Not being supervised, that might yeah. be the service but they still might be providing bodies to do some stuff and the bodies, if that's pure labor, might be hiring, captured. Might be captured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but we would say in terms of the amendments that are going through, th this is a good amendment. Yeah, most certainly, yes. And I'm, I must say, I, I had a sneaking suspicion that this might always be an amendment because it seemed to me that the real focus here was around labor hire, particularly internal labor hire, undermining enterprise agreements. I was never convinced it was really gonna be capturing an entire what I call contracted service industry. Because th there are many employers out there who specialize in providing holistic contracted services. And I'm not entirely sure the government ever really wanted to capture that. And what you might see as businesses look to outsource now is that they are looked out, if they are making the outsource decision, outsource the contract service. Outsource the whole service they're seeking to have done, not just a component of it, which involves getting labor hire in. It maybe they say, well, we're just gonna, cut this whole part of our business off and get someone else to provide it to us. And we'll pay you a fee for it. That, um, that might even involve uh, operating systems, business systems that you're using the whole, the whole box and dice. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So it's, it's, it's still there. It's on application, primarily focused at labor hire, both uh, commercial and internal labor hire. Um, we've now got this kind of get out of jail free card for contracted services but we still need to perhaps make an assessment as to whether or not we're very comfortable that what we're offering is a contracted service. That's right. And so a couple of the more recent developments from last night, government amendments have been approved to add a, a few extra little um, cherries on top. If a application is made to bind oh, this, a labour hire this is good provider this is good. to pay uh, a regulated host's um, rates of pay, then two things. One, if the regulated host updates its EA or enters into a new EA, automatically that new EA will be will apply to the labour hire provider. So the labour hire provider so will need be, to there'll match. There'll be continuity once the EA is replaced by a new one. You'll, you'll, if you're already subject to an order for the first one, you're immediately subject to the second. That's right. And then the more interesting one is if someone else starts doing the work that is regulated by one of these orders, whether they replace or they're just additional, the host themselves have an obligation to apply to the commission to extend the existing labor hire order to the new provider. And so what that really means is once this arrangement order in place, it will have a contagion effect that it will always kind of apply to this work. So, so uh, I can't get out of this by simply changing labor hire provider. That's right. That, that's the gist of it. Yep. Yeah. And um, perhaps we should just make a couple of comments. This is about the rate, it's not about forcing the labour hire company to adopt the entire agreement? Just the rate of pay for the work, <clears throat> that's right. That would have been received by the host's employees under the EA. And the last one, the application might not be for the actual rate in the EA? So it is possible, but the, the applicant needs to show it's appropriate in the circumstances. There are some circumstances where you might be able to seek a different rate of pay derived from a different industrial instrument if um, for whatever reason, that is more appropriate. Now, we'd be talking about some unique circumstances. The default will be the host employer's EA, but it could be that there's another EA within the host employer's business that is more relevant or appropriate for some or reason. Or it could be in time that there's an industry multi-employer EA. It could be. could be that. There's a, there's a bit of a funky thing like that in the New South Wales Act you and I've dealt with before about owner drivers. Yes, yeah. in, in terms of applying different, different rates, rates derived yeah. from somewhere it's, else. It's interesting. Um, and again, 
1 November 24, is that we still think? Yes, yeah, so right? 1 November 2024 is when it will commence. The big thing for people to remember is that if you take steps now to avoid the operation of this agreement, uh, sorry, of these laws, like for instance, ter- trying to terminate EAs, trying to terminate um, because the Because of these laws. Because of these laws. Um, the engagement of certain employees so that there's no reference mark um, for a labour hire application, then that avoidance behaviour can be subject to penalties now. So the, the offence won't come in till the laws commence, but that, it's actually retrospective. It, it dates if, back If the to, conduct starts now. If the conduct starts now. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so look, a lot better than where we started. Yes. That's probably the best way to describe it. it tremendously better than where we started. Um, road transport. What can what can I say? Uh, we have a lot of clients in this space. So where we wrote the book. We've written a book we're on road transport book. regulation. We so, so we, we'll have to write the second edition of the yes. book almost instantly. But that's okay. Um, now let, let's just start from the beginning. A lot of people bring ring up saying, "Is the road safety remuneration tribunal coming back?" I think we've been trying to say, "Look, it's not," but clearly. It, 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 it is a form of regulation akin to what the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal had. It's a form of regulation that has some elements of Chapter 6 in New South Wales covering owner drivers, and it's got some elements of what's happening in Victoria under the Victorian uh, Forestry and Owner Driver Act as, as well. So there's, there's kind of some elements coming in. We'll just start at the beginning. There's t- two, two bodies. We, we love expert panels now, don't we? Everything's got to, Everything's have, an, got an, expert everyone's got to have an expert panel. Um, you haven't been invited to join an expert panel? No, you haven't. No, I didn't think that's okay. Um, we're going to have an expert panel for transport now. Apparently, we need one. Um, and we're going to have an advisory group. Um, the advisory group's kind of, it is exactly what it says. It's an advisory group. I think what we'll find is, is that there'll be representatives there from uh, government, unions, industry, I haven't seen a formal constitution of the group yet. I've been talking to a few people who are saying they're getting phone calls about possibly joining it. Um, that advisory group could possibly suggest to the commission and the expert panel where it might steer its course or focus. But it's the actual, the expert panel itself is effectively the Fair Work Commission sitting as the commission exercising these powers, but it, it also has to have a designated expert sitting on the panel as well not dramatically different to the expert panel that's been created in the in the care sector. So the aged care case at the moment, the full bench has just been reconstituted. We've got three Fair Work Commission members and, and a, an expert who's been nominated by the government. So that, that's the kind of thing we'll have. Take us through what they can do, Lou. So the, the commission will be able to make minimum standards orders, much like we've talked about in relation to gig workers. It will also be able to, with, with, I might add, the similar list of things that are permitted and not permitted. So, again, you're talking about a lot of terms pertaining to um, payments, R- deductions, rates. base rates, but not overtime, rostering, etc. So, so, in that sense, it is contained. It's a contained power. It's not at large in terms of setting rates it, of remuneration and terms. It is. They can set a base rate, but they can't set penalty rates, things yeah. like that. Um the the tribunal will um, will effectively have, I suppose, a narrower scope than what exists in New South Wales currently because in New South Wales currently, you have contract determinations that go, do go to a range of matters that are in the prohibited list federally. Um, there will also be this collective agreement making process. We might see that more commonly in this space because there are collective, there are some, organisations that operate with collective agreements. National collective in, agreements. Well, sorry, they're currently doing it in New South Wales. Yeah. And so you might end up with national collective agreements, possibly, um, once the minimum standards please, orders please, are in If place. you're thinking about that, please don't do it till you come and talk to us. <laughs> that, that, that's that's right. Issue. I mean, that's a big issue. It, it does create uh, some ongoing hurdles, but um, probably more chance of seeing it in this space, though, than in the gig, I, I, I suspect. Agree. I'd agree with that. I'd agree um, with that. And then there's the unfair terminations for road transport regulated workers. So they can seek to be reinstated or have compensation up to six months pay, much like currently operates for employees or in the New South Wales system. We have this process already. Um, and so that's going to that's going to be introduced as part and, of these. And people. we should say, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, because I haven't seen the amendments on it from last night, but the, the scope of this is very similar in terms of who it captures. It's the New South Wales scope. It's, so you, it's the sole trader, the partnership, 
and the mum and dad corporation where a director or family member's driving the vehicle or... That's right. Yeah, so yes. there, there needs to be a, a comp... So, so generally, one of the parties involved needs to be a company for... We'll, we'll for call that the principal normally. The pri so, and usually it's going to be the principal. So there does need to be a company in there somewhere. But once there is a company in the contract somewhere, then the, if, the, if the driver is either a sole trader or a partnership or, a, or itself a company, as long as the director or the partners are the ones primarily involved in providing the service uh, or their family members, as long as it's limited to that, they would be caught by this type of regulation. And if it was a company, they being the company, that they're a director or... That's yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. Now, because we, we're familiar with that because that's the New South Wales world that we've lived in for yes, a very long time. Yes, so it very much replicates that, that regime. A little bit different to the... Victorian regime and a little bit different again to the Western Australian and regime. And interestingly, the Western Australian regime is not carved out. Doesn't get a mention. So, <laughs> so this will this will replace the Western Australian uh, regulations in this space. It will sit side by side with the Victorian and New South Wales. And we, my sense is, we've yet to truly understand what side by side means. Yes. That'll be a debate, I suspect, when we stand up. You and I stand up in front of the Road Transport Expert Panel. That'll be an interesting one. And um, given that the President of the Commission, Justice Hatcher is an ex-TW legal officer and probably knows this stuff better than most people. It'll be interesting to see if he sits mm -hmm. on it personally. So that'll be interesting. Now, the last bit's really important. So that, that's, that was in originally. It's still there. Yes. And this is the ability of the minister to say, look, I want you to look at regulating uh, a transport industry supply chain itself. Yes. Off you, off you go. So this is a regulation-making power. So the minister will have the ability. So he could, he could say, I want you to look at the uh, food supply chain involving Woolworths no, so this is the minister making regulations himself, oh, this is the regulation itself, not, the, not tribunal. the other tribunal. So the minister has a power, which we don't know how broad it will be, to make regulations affecting the contract chain, but that would need to be done by ministerial regulation. Uh, which is separate to the one I was talking about, which is there is a general power for the tribunal to look into supply chains specifically. So, for instance, it could, as it's always wanted to do, look at the Woolworths Coles supply chain inward and outward. That's right. Um, it, it can look at the entire supply chain and then determine from that what's necessary to make its minimum standards orders. orders. But the orders will only ever apply to the principal engaging the, the owner driver in the owner driver rather than necessarily Woolworths and yes yeah. yeah exactly okay and we might just crack on um, as we've said New South Wales and Victorian regimes are not extinguished by this that's right but we are yet to quite work out how how they sit it look it's possible that you might actually see say in New South when if they make an order you could actually see the order saying it excludes people covered in, by New South Wales contract determinations entirely possible um, Victoria might be a little bit more challenging because the Victorian system is not mandatory like the New South Wales system. It doesn't create statutory instruments. The Victorian system is basically a guideline system. So there's, there's a lot to be worked out here. But I suspect what you and I would both agree that it's it's not as bad as, say, the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal in terms no, of what it might do. And, and I think the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal was trying to link everything to safety, and sometimes the, the link there was distorted, questionable. Distorted, yeah. Whereas here, it's about what is a fair and reasonable safety net for people running this type of business and just getting straight to the chase. Now, the last bit's really important because that, that was the bit that kind of caught my eye, which is if, if uh, uh, let's say, the Transport Workers Union want a minimum order to be made, they issue a notice saying we want one, and the order can't actually commence until 24 months after the notice, notice is issued. Yes, which is which means that this is a slow burn. Yeah, and and I think perhaps that's based on an appreciation that they had a regulation making power with the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, where they they had an ability to intervene. They intervened too hastily. They want to ensure that whatever is implemented is sustainable, I think. And, I was, and my, my view about that is, without being too cynical, it does get you past the next federal election. <laughs> <laughs> um, Delegates rights, you might just crack in. I might let you start because yep. I'm currently debating this somewhere. So so, so um, first, first time ever. Uh, first time that we've had a, a, specific, um, yes, statutory. a specific statutory right, right. Yeah. for a delegate in the Act. Um, it's really the, the actual the actual right is split into various components. One, an employer must not unreasonably fail or refuse to deal with a workplace delegate, and the delegates are entitled to represent members 
or persons eligible to members in disputes with their employer. Um, what that really means is that when there is a dispute or a disciplinary process, an a employee who's a member of a union will be able to say, I want my union delegate to actually be here and speak for me. Now, that's very different, uh, as many of our viewers will know, to currently disciplinary context. Where the delegate context, might be the support, support person. person. Yeah. And indeed, there are lots of HR <laughs> practitioners out there who are very quick to say, you're a support person, <laughs> you can't do so much as sneeze, and we're going to have to have a cultural change there that support people will um, will become representatives where they're With union delegate. delegates. And as a result of that, there's going to be a real challenge for employers ensuring that when they're getting versions of events from their employee, that the employee's, employees version, yeah. ratifying whatever the delegate's saying or that it's going to be typed up and signed because what you don't want is an employee later on distancing themselves from what was said. Now, I'd probably say two things about this. Um, I was with a lot of employers very recently who, who, who aren't unionised. The first thing I, I want to say is I, I don't want people to be stressed and think that the legislation is going to compel you to have a union and compel you to have a union delegate. It's not about that. It's, it's where there is an authorised delegate in the workplace. So I would suspect that, that for, for businesses that are unionised, this probably isn't particularly troublesome and controversial. No. They, they've probably been living with most of this anyway. I suspect they might even, particularly in heavily unionised industries, they're going to have enterprise agreements to have similar things anyway. It's probably more the, the company who is not ex, hasn't got a history of exposure to unions and all of a sudden is exposed to unions and union delegates. There's a lot more to learn now than might have been the case. Yes. And I think that's probably where the drama sits. Now, the second element which is particularly intriguing is that the unions need to have reasonable access to the workplace and workplace facilities like phones uh, and and Did notice you want me to jump forward? Cetera. Jump yes. back. Uh, jump back, yeah, jump, yeah. Sorry. And workplace facilities. That's probably not too much of a big deal because, okay, give them the printer, give them a computer, that's not a big deal. But the really big one is reasonable access to paid time during normal working hours for the purposes of union training. Now, I don't know what reasonable access to paid time means it could mean five days a year. It could mean 10 days a year, depending on your business. How many delegates get this? Is it all the delegates? Is it just one per state? Is it just one per work site? None of that is answered in the legislation. And we're going to have to, my understanding is, is that there'll have to be a provision in a modern award about trade union training. Well, I'm going to call trade union training leave. It's, it's an old fashioned phrase. That'll probably be a test case next year. And that might give us some guidance as to what reasonable access exactly. to paid time means for the purposes of the Act. Absolutely. But the Act has its own obligation, reasonable access to paid time. So if you're a really big employer, it may be different to the award. Uh, absolutely. Um, if you're a small employer, um, well, if you're really small, a small business, you're exempt. But if you're a smallish employer, you're probably more going to align to whatever the award provides. And it'll be, it'll be a fun case. As I said to you, there's, there's only one arbitrated decision. It's New South Wales. And... Trade Union Training League was knocked back in New South Wales. It won't be knocked back this time, but that's quite an informative case. Outside of that, it became very common by consent mm. all across the federal jurisdiction. So that, that'll be an interesting, an interesting period. 24-24 is going to be a busy year. Um, quickly race through this, and then we'll, we might talk a little quickly about the amendments, and then we'll talk about marijuana. Yes, so, um, or marijuana testing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too excited. Uh, uh, um, uh, there is some greater level of ability to, ins to enter the workplace and inspect wage uh, theft or or underpayments. Broadly speaking, I chastise you, you know. <laughs> You're not allowed to use that phrase. It's wage just theft. It's propaganda. Uh, so um, unions can apply to the commission effectively without the employers knowing for what we call in legal terms an ex parte order that effectively allows the union to go onto the site without notice. Uh, as in without tw 24 hours notice to inspect an underpayment. I'm not too upset about this or too concerned because they do this anyway for safety breaches. So if a union wants to be quite provocative, annoying, uh, involve whatever not, particular not reason, anyway. they do it already with safety. And if you're in a bargaining context, uh, now it just means they can come on for underpayment inquiries and, and we as well as safety. we won't name the union who does that more often than not. Well, there's one union that does it, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but they all know that it's part of the playbook. This is just expanding it to underpayments. Yeah, so it, just, it, it just means one more thing that could be used 
tactically to come onto the work But it also might, in some particular circumstances, it might actually have a very legitimate Absolutely. basis as well, particularly if you're dealing with a, a very difficult uh, employee who's really just yep. trying to be protective of an unprotectable situation. It's aimed at destru- destruction of records, records yeah, I, was, I, was try- so. I was trying to get to that without saying it. I was trying to get to that. So we've talked about the modern awards. That'll that'll be a case next uh, next year. Yep. Um, you and I will have a debate who gets that. Um, we haven't done one together for a while. No, that's it right. Could be, it could be the moment. It could be the moment. And enterprise agreements have to have a clause. Uh, about delegates' rights as well. Yeah. yeah. Even if they're non-union? Yeah, there's got to be a clause in them, but I... I I don't think it's very that. specific as to what just, you need yeah. to contain. It's not a model clause at this stage. No. No, that's my understanding as well. And again, at this stage, unless somebody tells us otherwise, 1 July 24 is what's proposed. Yep. Now, look, I don't want to run out of time. So rather than talk about the Fair Work Commission getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which it is, we might quickly the amendment last yes, night. so, and I'll check it hasn't <laughs> been, no. no I'll, I'll, quickly, I'll quickly explain the amendment that drove me insane last night and... Lewis suggested I become a political journalist rather than somebody giving advice, which is fair enough. And I will not use the phrase I used last night, Lewis. I promise you I will not use it because <laughs> it, it'll upset everybody. Um, so as most people know, uh, one of the big changes in tranche one was uh, in, if you're in an intractable bargaining situation, you've been negotiating for a very long time, certainly over nine months past the agreement expiring or you starting negotiations, whichever was the later, we call that the Lewis rule. Might be a good rule now. Might be a good rule now. Could be a great rule now. Um, you could find yourself in a world where you say, look, we're never going to get a deal. Uh, we'll go and get this intractable bargaining order, which then pu- puts us on a path to arbitration. And you might criticise what you had to have regard to in the arbitration, but the bottom line was, was that the arbitration was basically a, what we would call a merits arbitration, the employer could go into the arbitration and say, well, look, you know, I, I need to change the roster clause to suit my business now. I need to do this. The union might very well say, well, you know, we want 12% pay increase, whatever. And the commission would hear a case. So, I, so I, I'm passing to you so I don't get emotional. So, so the Fair Work Commission was, was the one that would be arbitrating these disputes. The amendment that was proposed by the Greens yesterday afternoon that apparently has Labor's support according to the Australian Financial Review this morning and comments that have been attributed to Minister Burke, is that um, now if there is a term disputed in bargaining and that relates to an existing term in an enterprise agreement, that when the Commission arbitrates that bargaining dispute, the term, and this is for each and every term in dispute. So I you, think the word is matter, each matter. Yes, for each and every one of those that is in dispute, Um, the term ultimately arbitrated must not be less favourable than what's in the current enterprise agreement. For an employee or a union. For an employee or the union. And so what you're talking about is the enterprise agreement effectively becomes the baseline. And if there is any dispute, the arbitration can only either match or be above the baseline in terms of the nature of the provision. So to take Nigel's example, let's say you have a rostering clause that requires certain things to happen and an employer says, oh, from now on, actually, doesn't we don't suit want my to business. do this. We don't it work that way. If that is in, that, that must be the same or more favourable for the employees or the commission cannot arbitrate it. Um, well, they can arbitrate it, but they can't, but they can't get the outcome they're seeking. What that means in practice is that when you enter bargaining, you will have, as an employer, a very different dynamic. You're going to have a dynamic where you know if you can't reach an agreement, it can only ever go up for the unions. It can only ever be the same as the AO up, which means you're either going to use some of Nigel's magic cultural engagement um, initiatives, which generally need a, years. A, a years to years. implement, to actually carry the workforce with you uh, because Nigel's at his best when it's a multi-EA strategy with, with high levels of engagement across the workforce. If you can't do that, which is going to be hard in a, in a short term, get your checkbook out. You're going to have to buy the get your checkbook out, out. Yeah. and and obviously the price for that Might will be up. higher because the unions are in now a significantly more uh, favourable position. And from look, the bargaining I, I, and I'm, I won't I won't get carried away because you know I got carried away last night and I won't use that term. But um, <laughs> what we're really facing here is really sad because it's it's one sided it's one sided arbitration the employer goes into the arbitration with their hands effectively to sort of tied behind their back, which is very sad. 
what upsets me the most isn't just that. It kind of defeats the role of arbitration because the role of arbitration, historically, if you look at arbitral jurisdictions like the New South Wales Commission, the role of arbitration was effectively both sides come along, but both sides know they might lose something. So guess what they do? In the conciliation before the arbitration, they start to moderate their position and become more reasonable. And so 99 times out of 100, guess what happens? A deal's cut and you yep. don't need the arbitration. If you don't have that hanging over one party's head, they've got nothing to lose in trying to conciliate. They'll just keep going, well, if you don't give us what we want, we'll go to arbitration because we can only win. Well, and, and so there's really big ramifications here. I mean, the really concerning thing is the Fair Work Commission is constrained. It's not actually doing I don't think Fair Work Commission will like this. Uh, it would be, I'm, I'm just it, guessing, it, but it I don't con, think it, it will. It would constrain their discretion. And the value of arbitration in the context of conciliation. And, and if you look uh, more recently, the prominent bargaining disputes, the Commission's started to develop a bit of a reputation of being able to roll up the sleeves and get through them. Commissioner Reardon has, yeah. has had a very prominent role in a number of disputes now, Sydney trains, uh, there's been others as well, some are clients, I'm not going to mention them, um, <laughs> where he's developed a reputation in particular for sorting things out. That only happens when both sides have something to lose, as you say. So it's going to neuter the, yeah. the capability of some really – traditional industrial kind of facilitation or mediation. And, and look, we'll watch this space. Um, the problem with everything you and I've just said is will, will the journalist understand everything we've just said? Uh, will, will, will the will employer... Will, will David we, Pocock. Will David <laughs> Pocock, will Jackie Lambie, will the, will the employer movement, you know, get behind this or is there so much it's trying to argue about it gets diluted? But you, you and I'll watch that space and we'll, we'll report back. But, yeah, this is... This is a small little thing which actually has massive ramifications. Much bigger than many of the other reforms. Forms, yeah, in many ways. Now, we've got about 12 minutes left, and I've got a couple of questions I'd like to get to, but very quickly, let's just do medicinal marijuana. Medicinal marijuana, that's right. <laughs> I, I don't want to ask the Bob Clinton, the Bill Clinton question, which is, have you ever inhaled? But we won't, we won't we don't go have there. to, don't but, but um, the disability discrimination Let me act, pass that to you. Oh, thank you. Um, is probably a helpful starting place here. So obviously we have workplaces that conduct drug and alcohol testing. They have a right to expect- Most large, most large. Most large businesses do. They have yeah. a right to expect that people will present for work in a manner that's safe. And particularly if you're in a safety critical industry, heavy machinery, um, it's quite important to ensure the zero tolerance for people having substances in their system, even if they used it on the weekend. Enter the Disability Discrimination Act. Indirect discrimination occurs where a discriminator, let's call that the company, requires or proposes to require someone to comply with a condition. And because of a disability, a person, let's call that the employee, cannot comply with the requirement and it has the effect of disadvantaging the employee um, because of the condition that they have or, or disability that they have. And it does need to be a disability, but a disability could be an illness, an injury, etc. If that condition that's been imposed is unreasonable in the circumstances, we have what we call unlawful indirect discrimination. So there's a requirement, someone because of their disability cannot comply, it's unreasonable, has the effect of disadvantaging them, that requirement indirectly and unlawfully Discriminates. So I could have an autoimmune condition. I could be suffering from extreme pain, and I manage that pain in part by taking medicinal marijuana. Into uh, medicinal marijuana. Um, the question then becomes. By the way, that's not me. That's <laughs> the question then becomes: Can an employer say, "Well, we have a zero tolerance approach to people having any mar marijuana in the system"? Well, if it was for recreational use, yes. But if it's for medicinal purposes all of a sudden you're back in this entire regime of is it reasonable? And whether it's reasonable or not is largely going to depend on what the impact of that medicinal marijuana usage is on that employee on a daily basis. And not not all medicinal marijuanas are the same. Not all medicinal marijuanas are the same. I, As you found out recently. I found out there's three <laughs> kinds uh, uh, of different types with different presence of substances in them. And at the end of the day, it's going to be very difficult to have a blanket policy. What you're going to need is medical evidence. Yeah. Just like when someone presents to you with a broken arm or with a bad back, you need medical evidence as to what is the nature of this substance they're taking, what's the impact it will have on their day-to-day -day work, and 
Is it something that will actually impair them in using machinery, et cetera? And unless you have a medical opinion that says, yes, this person is, is actually at a greater risk of hurting themselves or others, unless you have that medical opinion, you're probably in a very good position to breach the Discrimination Act. Um, and I would though caution this, that what employers should be doing is focusing everything on disclosure up front because what you don't want is recreational usage being cast as medicinal usage. It'll happen. It will happen, but the way to get around that is to have a policy that says, if you are taking medicinal marijuana, you must disclose in advance. As with any other uh, prescribed drug. That's right. Most policies and say And then we, we will work through what the impact of that is. And the commission's already been For very you, clear. in your job. That's right. And the commission's been very clear that if someone fails to disclose the fact that they're taking medicinal marijuana, that is a valid reason for dismissal because it robs the employer and the employee of the ability to assess this. But in this case, we've got up there, uh, I think that... Um, this employee was dismissed successfully because they failed to disclose. Close, yeah. But had they had they actually disclosed, it may have been a very different scenario. And we've got we've got some some other cases up here that talk about uh, I would have accepted this is an unfair dismissal case, an argument of harshness in the dismissal process. Um, given um, they did not appear to be impaired, and then we've got a federal circuit court case. I do not accept the proposition which underpinned much of the submissions of the employer the nature of the issue is such that the only way to ensure there's no risk of health and safety is refrain from the taking of medication. Um, and so what we're seeing is a non-acceptance of blanket approaches. What you need is disclosure and then a nuanced approach to actually understand on each case, are they truly impaired? And this, this, I'd probably say if people are starting to worry about this, come and have a chat to us yeah. because let's get in early and try and get through this. As you said, some medicinal marijuana has THC in it, some some apparently doesn't, and there's grades in between, which I, I never knew that, but that, that was that that was informative to me. And you also bring into vogue the constant discussion I have with safety people about impairment versus the risk of impairment. And so look, it, it's it's a bit of a swamp. Yeah. Uh, it's coming. Uh, if you've got any anxieties about it, give us a call. I'd probably throw you straight to Lewis because Lewis is doing all the early work on it, but um, it, it's worth thinking about how's your drug and alcohol policy and procedure going to respond to this and will it respond to it effectively? And a few, a few weeks out from Christmas, the high, the high court didn't want to play. No, no. So, <laughs> so there's a decision around Easter. It's public holidays cases uh, conveniently seem to land right when the public holidays are falling. So there's a decision around Easter about public holiday rostering, uh, which was somewhat inconvenient for employers. That was appealed that, to that's the That's very generous. <laughs> that was appealed to the High Court and so the this, High this Court. Is, this is a situation where for years, particularly around Easter, people had rostered people to work on the public holiday. Everybody knew they were going to work on the public holiday and everybody took turns on being rostered onto the public holiday. This is a classic 24-7 industries. It, it was standard fare. Everybody accepted it. Race off to the court and the court goes, oh, you can't quite do that. Well, you can't just roster straight away. Yeah. What you need to do is make it clear that that's a request to work. If the employee refuses and that refusal is unreasonable, you can direct them to work. But the problem is everyone's just rostering as if yeah. they have this right to tell someone to work. So you need to make it clear on the roster or in some other way that when you're saying Nigel, you're working Christmas Day. That's actually a request. That's actually a request, <laughs> even though it's just a roster uh, and we haven't really had any other discussions. So you need to think creatively about how it is that you're going to ensure that whatever you're doing to get shift workers working their usual pattern, that it's clear it's a request. And the court did make it clear very quickly. They said, this doesn't mean you can't have a roster. It just means you need to have something in that roster that tells people when we've allocated you the public holiday, you have this right. It's to, a request, yeah. and you actually have a right to refuse. And you then go down to the normal process in terms of whether or not the right to re the refusal right. is reasonable in the circumstances and, and so forth. Um, and this went up to the high court. It went up to the high court. And the high, and high court, court said we don't want to look at it. Well, yeah, they endorsed the federal court yeah, approach. We're not going to look at it now. Um, Where's the question? That, that was a lot. We got four minutes, so I get to ask the first question of that. That's fine. Um, so the first question that came through, which I've, I've been completely unrelated to anything we talked about today, um, wage theft. Yes. I'll use the term. I hate it, but I'll use it. Um, how do you go to jail? Uh, well, you can. <laughs> um, 
a, a really pleasing development from these reforms. The, the underpayment needs to be intentional. You must have had knowledge uh, that the amounts you were paying were not compliant with any of the workplace laws. If you intentionally don't comply with a workplace law in relation to payments, that is now a criminal offence and generates the possibility of jail or criminal fines. But importantly, reckless or inadvertent underpayments, there are only civil liabilities for. And I, you and I would say that that is a really important distinction. It is. Because the great majority of underpayments you and I have met in our careers are, let's use the phrase, inadvertent. Yes. They're not intended. Although from time to time, you and I probably have met people who knowingly have decided to take the risk. Well, I think where there's going to be still concern for employers is where there's a long-standing practice that they've discovered. And then if you discover there's a problem, you're going to have to rectify it. Once you open the hood, you've got to deal with everything that's going on underneath it. And that seems to be the flavor. I mean, we're doing a lot of wage awards. It's still, and we'll probably keep doing a lot more next year. That is the flavor of uh, what we're seeing all the time, which is if, if somebody finds something that, that wasn't expected to be there, they're actually they're actually fixing it mm. holistically fixing it for the past and the future yeah and that'll continue on and this creates an impetus to do that which is good it, it, it is indeed um do you think labor hire is going to end up being uh used less in this country over the next five years uh, well i think businesses use labor that, hire that was one of the questions that came through it's an interesting question for, for one of three reasons you use labor hire because the labour hire provider is cheaper. If you're doing that, well, there's much less incentive to do it. You use labour hire because of fluctuations in work demand mean you can't actually get the resources well, that's going yourself. To be the same. So that's going to be the same. So talk about health. Health, it's not about undercutting wages. In health, it's just they just can't get the staff. That's going to be the same. They're getting Labour hire will continue to proliferate yeah, in health. I agree. And some businesses use labour hire as a foil for industrial action during bargaining because they know if they have a mixed workforce, at least they can rely on the labour hire. That could still remain. I'd agree. I, I think the, perhaps the more interesting policy question is going to be whether or not in relation to government-related activity, both state and federal governments start to move more to a uh, an in-source model rather than an outsource model, particularly for, say, things like nursing, health and, and, and industries like that. But that... that you know, is, will the government put its money where its mouth is? That'll, that that would be interesting. Um, Lewis, we, we we might leave it there. Um, c come and see us. There's a lot going on. It's probably, you're, you're weary. I'm probably a bit weary, even though I've had a good holiday this year. Um, 2024 is probably going to be as big a year as I can remember. So get ready for it. There'll be a lot of change, irrespective of which industry you're in. Um, it's been a pleasure this year. Uh, it has. Thank you for joining us Thank throughout you. the year. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. It has been a lot of fun. And we'll be back next year. We'll be back next year. We've really enjoyed the follow-up after these sessions as well. Um, you put a couple of things up there on the board that, you know, if you want to come and talk to us about, that's fine. Still getting a lot of activity around the Respect at Work positive duty. We're spending a lot of time on that. Um, and, yeah, probably increased training recently around quite yes. a few things uh, and education. Uh, but next year will be big. Last time to say this, have a in front of everybody else, have a great Christmas. Yes, thank you. And please to the and audience, to yeah, to you, have a great Christmas, have a safe Christmas, and to the extent that you can get some time for yourself and your families, please, please enjoy it. It's going to be a busy 2024 for the industrial community, the HR community, and the safety community, and we look forward to seeing you next year. You take care.